Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to part two. <laughs> if you were on earlier, you heard my husband share an incredible um, message about the suffering of Christ. And sometimes I think we forget what he actually went through, how awful, absolutely awful it really was. Well, I'm going to change the picture to Isaiah 54, so if you want to turn to that. Because of his great and almighty sacrifice, we can enjoy his blessings. And this this chapter in Isaiah is really all about his blessings. It's so incredible. When you get down, you need to turn to this and read it. Because basically that's what I'm going to be doing is reading it, maybe making a few comments. But I want you to see how much he loves us, how much he truly loves us. So let's start. Verse 1, sing, O barren, you have you who have not born. And I believe that's referring to Israel. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. I'm sorry, I got it mixed up. This is referring to Israel who was supposed to give birth and it's looking outside of Israel now. For more of the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. So here's Israel. It was supposed to give birth, was supposed to increase, was supposed to uh, send the message out and, 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 and become more than before, but it didn't happen. So the Lord went outside of them to the Gentiles, to us. And enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes for you shall expand to the right and to the left and your descendants will inherit the nations. Control, you're going to inherit means control, gain the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. And I, and I think about our church. I, I, when I read that, I felt like God is saying, stretch out those tent posts. Uh, what can we do to expand, to include, to gain, control the nations of our neighborhood? What can we do? And um, I want us to pray into that. I really want to see us being more inclusive. And then in, in verse four, do not fear. I think um, I'm going to, if I have time, I'm going to go back to a psalm. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed. Neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. For you will forget the shame of your youth, and you will not remember the reproach of your wood, wind, widowhood anymore, for your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. Now, I want to say this many times. Many of us feel abandoned. Whether you've lost a spouse, there's huge abandonment. Maybe you've lost a child. There's another feeling of abandonment. Maybe you've lost friends. There's a lot of time. Or maybe nothing of significant happens, but you hear voices in your head saying, you are worthless. You should be ashamed of yourself. You have no worth. And so you feel abandoned. You feel abandoned by your friends, your family, even though they, they're not saying those things to you. So we do feel shame and we do feel disgrace, but God doesn't want us to. Let's continue. Um, for, and I'm going to go back. For your maker is your husband, Jesus, God. The God of hosts is his name. And your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, and He is called the God of the whole earth. That's our husband. How incredible. How can I ever feel abandoned? How can I ever feel alone? How can I ever? I have Him, and He will never. We know He never leaves us or forsakes us. He is always there. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when when you were refused says your God, for a mere moment I have forsaken you. Remember in the Old Testament he did, he'd get kind of angry with some of the people and he did say, I'm done. But with great mercies, I will gather you. So he went back and he said, no more. After Noah's thing, no more. I'm not doing that anymore. With a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment, he said, just for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you. 
says the Lord, your Redeemer. So we don't have to worry again, there's going to be a flood because of our actions. There might be a flood because of other reasons, but not because of God's anger. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be angry with you, nor rebuke you. Now, I love this next verse. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. You know, there are mountains in our lives. There are hills in our lives. There are things that we just are, we just feel are impossible. They're absolutely impossible. I can't move a mountain. I can't move a hill. I can't shake a mountain. I can't shake a hill. It's impossible to me. But God says he's going to take care of it for us. And I think Pastor talked about um, the impossibilities. When we come to those impossibilities in our life, God has to take over. And sometimes he brings us to those places. So we say, Uncle, I'm done. I can't do anything. Now I'm going to keep reading and we'll see how he handles those situations. Oh, you afflicted one, tossed with tempest and not comforted. Behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems. Now look look at how much he's blessing us. And these aren't things you put in your pocket. This is in the spiritual. And lay your foundations with sapphires. And I will make your pinnacles of rubies. And your gates of crystal. And all your walls of precious stones. So the things you're going through, he's going to turn them into gems. The trials and tribulations are just going to be rubies. The foundation of our trial is sapphires. See, it's really nothing when God's involved. It becomes rich when God's involved. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be stable, firm. You shall be permanent in righteousness. And you shall be far from oppression, far from injury, far from fraud. And from terror, for it shall not come near you. And from ruin, for it shall not come near you. Indeed, they shall surely assemble, but not because of me. Whoever assembles against you shall fall for your sake. Isn't that incredible? Behold, I have created... Now, this is interesting to me. I have created the blacksmith who blows the coals in the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work. So he's created the man... That makes the weapons. And I've destroyed the spoiler. To destroy. I, I have created the spoiler to destroy. So he created our enemies. You know weapon formed against you shall prosper. We've heard that over and over again. But yet you know what. I kind of think we don't believe it. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment. You shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants. If you're a servant of the Lord, that's your heritage. If you're not a servant of the Lord, it's not your heritage. You must serve the Lord. You must serve the Lord. And he will do those things. And the righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Now let me just say this. Many of us have fights. We have things we're going through. The impossibilities. And we always know it's for a time and a season. We do know that. But we know that, um, and you have to remember this always, that God is for you, not against you, right? He is for you, not against you. And, and the, next, the next chapter talks about that, about his thoughts are for us. So if you're a servant of God, you're going to know this. He's going to, he is not going to let, he is not going to let a weapon prosper against you. Now, what does that mean though? It means that his will will be done. It means that maybe what I thought, the way I wanted it to be solved, is not what he's thinking. But he still wins, doesn't he? He still, we still prosper. Let me tell you that there are people that have died. We've prayed for them. We prayed for them that they would be healed, but they died. But you know what? In their death, there was life. People came to the Lord because of that. So we don't always know the ways, the path 
the answers God has for us. But you know what? Again, we're going to still keep praying. I want someone to be healed. I want someone to um, be a testimony in that. But ultimately, God says, No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. And that's another thing. Some of our battles are in our heads. Tremendous battles are in our minds. And we're hearing voices. God wants us to still those voices. He wants us to say, Nope, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. You might speak to me things in my head, telling me that I should be ashamed, that I'm worthless, I'm a nobody. Oh, but God, he's building a foundation of sapphires for me. He's building a pinnacle in my life of rubies. I have to remember his blessings. I have to remember that all of this is based on being a servant of God. If you're not a servant of God, I don't know what to say. Now, I want to quickly, um, while Pastor was sharing, I want to just turn um, to Psalm 25. I was way in the wrong neighborhood. Okay, Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Oh, my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. This is, a, this is amazing. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Do not be ashamed today. Do not. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindness. For they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to your mercy, remember me. For your goodness sake, O Lord, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he teaches sinners in the way. He, The humble he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. And all the ways of the Lord are mercy and truth. To such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. I'm not going to keep going. It's a pretty long psalm, but do you get it? See, Jesus cut his teeth on all these things. Isaiah cut his teeth on all these things, telling us, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. If you're a servant of the Lord, do not be ashamed. So, again, speaking of the servant of the Lord, what he did for us was incredible. It's just incredible. And it, and it breaks my heart that some people turn their back on that, but baby me in their heart of hearts, they really didn't get it. They didn't really understand what, who Jesus is, who God the Father is, who the Holy Spirit is. So we need to pray for those people. We need to pray for the lost. We need to pray for the world. So at this time, we're going to partake of his body, his bread. And dear Jesus, we, we thank you for willingly give your body up for us, dear God, willingly just die for us. Such a horrible, horrible disfigurement, a horrible death of pain and suffering and separated from your father during that time, which was agony for you, but you did it for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for setting us free and help us this day to know because of your death, you you have set us free and you have blessed us beyond what we can ever imagine. Thank you, dear God, for your riches abound. Thank you, dear Jesus, for your love abounds. Thank you, dear God, for all that you've done. Amen. And your blood, Jesus, your precious, precious blood that was shed for us, just poured out for us, Lord. But three days later, you, you came back to us. And because of that, we rise again in life from death, Lord. May every day be a new resurrection for us in our hearts. Looking to you, dear God, for all things. May we be your servant, O God. May we be your servant. And may no weapon prosper against us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now it's time for online Sunday school. This has become a joke because I don't know why I can't remember the um, 
website, of course, people that know me know that's not unusual. So the website is Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship, Lord, L-H-C-F, slash Warren, dot com. Did I get it right? Slash Sunday School. So, and again, I don't even know why I have to say that because a lot of you that are already on know that. Let's see, uh, she just sent it up. Yes, I did it right. So if you want to get on, you want your children to hear uh, the, the lessons of Jesus, I would encourage you. So I'm finished, and uh, my husband's going to take over. So I pray that he has a good word. He already started with the good word, and he just continues. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're going to go back to Colossians chapter 1. So you can head there, and we will look at Colossians 1. We've spent a few weeks on that. I, w- I wanted to tie in Isaiah 53 with Colossians 1 today, the servant of the Lord, the suffering servant of the Lord, with Paul's apostolic imperative in Colossians 1. So just as a review, what we've what we're looking at is Colossians 1, beginning in verse 24. Paul talks about his apostolic ministry. And he he describes it in verse 24 of Colossians 1. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I fill up the things that are lacking of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body, which is the church. Paul is making a reference there to Isaiah 53. We said that Isaiah 53 is on two levels. The level we looked at it in the Bible study, which we did uh, at 1015, we looked at it on the level of how it applies to Jesus. First and foremost, the servant of the Lord is Jesus. And it is through his work that we are made righteous. It's through his work that our debt is canceled. It is through his work that our sins are forgiven. It is through his work that we become his inheritance and then he gives us our inheritance. Now, you noticed Isaiah 53, the servant does all of these things on our behalf and gives healing to us and forgiveness to us and empowerment to us. And then Jan went into chapter 54, and in 54 then it shows how the fortunes, the history of Israel turns. Israel goes from being in exile to being in the land. And you noticed at the end, and Jan emphasized it in Isaiah 54, now Israel is called the servants, plural, of the Lord. Because of the servant of the Lord and his work in Isaiah 53, we become the servants of the Lord. And we become the servants of the Lord and we participate in the completion of his work for human history. It's the kingdom of God. We become co-laborers with the Lord in the gospel to bring forth the kingdom of God. The kingdom of the world become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. Revelation eleven fifteen kind of sums up the purpose of the church. So that all of that work that the servant does to, to, to bring Israel back to him and to bring the nations back to the Lord. Uh, we participate in that by becoming the servants of the Lord. So when Paul talks about his apostolic ministry, he's talking about it in the context of Isaiah 53, Isaiah 54. Actually, that whole second Isaiah Isaiah 40 through 55, that that one long prophecy in the courtroom of the Lord where the Lord illustrates how he's going to establish his eschatological purposes in the earth, his, his kingdom purposes for human history. 
So when Paul says, I am rejoicing in my sufferings, okay, sufferings of the servant in Isaiah 53, now uh, sufferings that Paul himself is experiencing that enter into what is called the afflictions of the Messiah, the afflictions of Christ, the, the tribulations of the Messiah. So Paul sees his suffering, which is for you, for the Colossians, for the church, for all the churches that Paul has established. He rejoices in his sufferings for you, and he fills up what is lacking of the afflictions of Christ. The church struggles to enter into God's purposes because the church, as the church, refuses to suffer. N nobody wants to suffer. Nobody enjoys suffering. But suffering is, is, is the lot of, of humanity. It's the lot of human beings. But we're looking now at Christological suffering, the suffering that Jesus went through, according to Isaiah 53, to impart healing and forgiveness and life and strength and power to us. The sufferings that he went through, we now enter into that whole process of the sufferings of the Messiah and then we become mature, we become ministers of the gospel, we become those servants of the Lord in Isaiah 54 now who can in turn go forth and bring the new heavens and the new earth into human history and human existence. Now that's what third Isaiah is going to be about. Isaiah 56 through 66, third Isaiah is going to elaborate on how Israel participates in this process of establishing the new heavens and the new earth in human history. So when Paul says he fills up what is lacking, there's an impartation. See, apostolic ministry imparts. It imparts the grace of the Lord. It imparts the counsel of God. It imparts the revelation of Jesus within the church and outside of the church to the nations so that the nations can become part of God's people and part of God's family. But the church ultimately needs first an impartation to enter into the servanthood of the Lord. Now, what I want to point out is before we read verse 24, what does Paul say in verse 23? He says in verse 23, he's exhorting the Colossians to continue in the good news, in the gospel that was proclaimed to them by Paul's apostolic team when they, when, when they came to Christ and a church was planted in Colossae. Paul says in verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven. Now the hope of the gospel Hope is mentioned three times in this passage. Hope uh, in uh, Colossians 1 verse 5 gives birth to faith and love in our lives. We need hope. That's how we enter into the love of God. That's how we increase in faith. We need hope to do that. And that hope uh, comes in terms of the gospel. It's the hope of the gospel. It means that all the promises that have been made to us in the gospel by Jesus as he proclaimed that gospel. Hope means we expect them to be fulfilled. We are confident and trust that everything the Lord has promised he will fulfill in our lives, in our ministry, and in the, the unfolding of the, the church and the church's prophetic and apostolic testimony. God is faithful. He will fulfill all his promises. That's, all, that's what hope is. Hope is simply, I expect God to fulfill his promises. I trust that God will fulfill his promises. I rest in God's promises. I embrace God's promises. And we said the practical outworking of hope is the Lord lets us know what he's going to do. He lets us know what 
is going to take place in the future, the new heavens and the new earth, and then we begin to live now as if those things are true. You don't wait for things to be true in your life when you're walking in hope. Faith makes the things promised fulfilled and true. But hope means while I'm waiting for those things to happen, I act as if they're true. I live as if they're true. And then, of course, the third manifestation of hope comes uh, in verse 27. But let's finish verse 23. He says, we're, we're, we're going to walk in this hope of the gospel which we've heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. I became a servant. Now, Paul calls himself many things in uh, chapter 1 of Colossians, but when Paul says he's a minister of the gospel, he means he's a servant. The servant terminology that Paul uses when he says he's a minister is a reference to the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 40 through 55. And then he says, and we'll repeat it again, I now rejoice in my sufferings, which are for you, and I fill up, I impart the things that are lacking of the affliction of Christ in my flesh for his body, which is the church, and he repeats again, of which I became a servant according to the commission of God which was given to me for you to fulfill or to fill up to fulfill the word of God. So this is what a minister in the gospel does. He fills up what is lacking in the church. He fulfills, he helps to fulfill the word of God. He fills up all the promises that are in the gospel through impartation that is given to him in his apostolic commission to impart to others. The issue of impartation is very important. The issue of impartation is a key issue in Isaiah 53. We will look at that. Let's continue, though, with these verses. And how does he fulfill the word of God Verse 26 says, The mystery which has been hidden from the ages and from generations, but is now revealed to his saints. God is revealing the gospel, and God is revealing who the servant of the Lord is, who Jesus is. He's revealing this, and it is through revelation of the gospel. It's through revelation of the power of the Spirit. It's through revelation of who Jesus is that the church becomes the servants of the Lord. We, there's an impartation. When we see him as he is, we become like him. That's 1 John chapter 3. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know this, that when he appears, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. See, seeing him as he is is how you become like him. And then the next verse says, and every man that has this hope in him. See, see the, it's the hope. It's not just seeing Jesus as he is. It's hoping to continue to see him as he is. It's hoping to see the gospel revealed to us. It's hoping to see the gospel worked out in our lives. Every man who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he, Jesus, is pure. It's about being sprinkled. It's about being sprinkled, being made pure in Christ, being equipped. And Paul says, to whom, and that's the saints, the church, God willed, God's determined purpose, God's pleasure was to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the nations. So there's a determined purpose that we saw in Isaiah 53 in the Bible study. The determined purpose was that it was the Lord's determined purpose to crush Jesus, to crush the servant, to cancel debt, to forgive the sin of God's people, to free God's people from guilt, to impart God's righteousness, and to strengthen God's people to return from exile and to do it in the midst of all the nations. He's not just doing this for our sake. He's doing this for the whole world to see. God is moving in the church so the whole world could see. And what is the world going to see 
when God reveals the full riches of the glory of this mystery. Christ in you, Christ in your midst, Christ in the midst of his people and calling the nations to come in and be part of his people. Christ in your midst, there it is, the hope of glory. It's hope that creates faith and love. It's the hope of the gospel. And now it's the hope of glory. And the glory is to see God in his full manifest, high and lifted up presence as Isaiah did in chapter 6 and as the servant of the Lord did in Isaiah 52, 13. The hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning every man and teaching every man. We correct people and we instruct people. Warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom so that we may present every man mature in Christ. See, there's the apostolic imperative. An impartation to the church to mature the church so that the mature the, the matured church can bear witness to the Lord and his purposes in human history. And it says, um, for this we also labor. We do the heavy lifting. We do hard work. We get our hands dirty, for which we also labor, striving, agonizing, according to the energy of God, which works powerfully in us. Now see, that's where we connect with Isaiah 53, this whole issue of impartation. Now, we, we, we want to look at a, a couple things, first of all. You know, we talked about Isaiah 53. We're going to go there. But first we want to go to Galatians chapter 1. Paul said he's the servant. The Lord commissioned him to be a servant of the gospel. He is making a reference there to the servant ministry of the Lord that is seen in Isaiah 53. But watch what Galatians says. Galatians 1 says this. Galatians 1 Verse 14. Well, let's start with Galatians 1.13. Paul is relating his past, and he's talking about how he persecuted the church. Galatians 1.13. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. Before he came to the Lord, he thought the church was against the purposes of the Lord. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Paul was very zealous to become a Jew that served Yahweh in Yahweh's covenant. He says, but when it pleased God. Now see, this issue of God's pleasure, it pleased God to pierce, to crush to desecrate the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 53 so that he might be crushed and we might receive the inheritance. It pleased the Lord. It was God's pleasure in Colossians chapter 1 to reveal the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of the word of God, Jesus Christ, the hope of glory. And here it pleases God and notice the language Paul uses, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the nations. Paul said it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me. Paul is making a direct reference to one of the four servant songs in Isaiah 40 through 66. Go with me to Isaiah 49. Now on, on, on your way to Isaiah 49, within the second Isaiah, where we, where we look at this return from exile, the Lord bringing his people back from exile, reestablishing them in the land, causing them to be raised up to build Jerusalem, to build, rebuild the temple, to rebuild Jerusalem, to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem so the Lord can come and inhabit Zion and make Zion great. 
that's the, the purpose that we see in Isaiah 40 through 66. We're going to, the Lord's going to return his people from exile, from the domination of Babylon, who forcibly took God's people from their land and enslaved them, if you will, a second enslavement parallel to the Egyptian enslavement early in Israel's history, enslaved them there. And then the Lord rises up, defeats Babylon, and causes his people to come back. And so what we see in Isaiah 40 through 66 is the return of the people from the exile and then the reestablishment of Zion and Jerusalem, the rebuilding of Zion and Jerusalem. In, as, as, as this prophecy, it's, it's, uh, it runs from chapter 40 through 55, 16 chapters. It's a single prophecy. A new prophecy starts at chapter 56 through 66, as I've mentioned. The Lord is in his heavenly courtroom. Isaiah 40 through 55 is the Lord in his courtroom, in his heavenly courtroom, just like Daniel 7. It's just, it's just a different picture. In Daniel 7, it's the Son of Man in the courtroom of the Lord. And in Isaiah 40 through 55, it's the servant of the Lord in the courtroom of the Lord. Both the Son of Man and the servant of the Lord terminology applied by Jesus and to Jesus uh, concerning describing his ministry in the Gospels. Four songs or four texts, servant songs, servant texts emerge. The first is uh, in Isaiah 42. We'll look at that in a moment. The second is in Isaiah 49. That's what we want to look at now. The third is in Isaiah 50. And the fourth we looked at this morning, Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12. That's the fourth and final. Now look at this one, the third one. Remember what Paul said in Galatians, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me to his grace. Here's the second servant song, the second time the servant appears. And in each one of the songs, a different aspect of the servant's ministry is brought forth. Look at this ministry uh, aspect of the servant. Listen to me, O coastlands, Isaiah 49.1. And give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named me by name. This is what Paul is referring to. He's referring to verse 1 and verse 5. We'll continue to read it. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver he hid me away. And he said to me, You are my servant. Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Now the servant is an individual figure. He's also identified with Israel. Israel was the original servant of the Lord, raised up in the earth to accomplish God's purposes in the earth. Israel failed. That's why Israel was exiled. The servant now who identifies in his own life with the history of Israel now will become the ultimate servant of the Lord so that in Isaiah 54, Israel can become the servants of the Lord. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense with my God. Even the servant becomes weary because the task that God has given him appears to be impossible. Even the servant Lord, we, we saw Jesus in his own life. Jesus would have moments where he would just cry out, Lord, help me. He cried out in Gethsemane, Lord, let this cup pass me. He cries out, but the Lord is there too impart strength for him. His justice and righteousness and vindication is with the Lord. His payment, which will be that he produces a people, as we saw in Isaiah 53, the servant who suffers and dies will see his seed. He will see his offspring. There will be this, this glorious manifestation of God's people from all the nations of the earth as the Lord spoke to Abraham will come through the servant's work. And now the Lord says, 
he who formed me from the womb to be his servant. As Paul says, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal Christ to me. Paul is saying, as he did in Colossians 1, 23 and 1, 25, he's the servant of the Lord. He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the eyes of my Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, the Lord says to the servant, he continues, it's too small of a thing that you should be my servant simply to raise up the tribes of Jacob and bring Israel and to bring back the preserved of Israel, the chosen ones of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations and my salvation so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So the servant is going to gather Israel back to Yahweh and bring the nations to Yahweh. That's Paul's apostolic call. When he identifies himself with the servant of the Lord, he's identifying with this call in Isaiah 49. So in Isaiah 49, the ministry of the servant is to bring Israel and the nations back to the Lord. Let's go backwards to Isaiah 42. That's the first servant song. The first servant song. The first time the servant appears in Isaiah 40 through 66, the Lord says in his heavenly throne room, in his heavenly courtroom of justice, behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I will put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. The first aspect of the servant's ministry is to bring the justice of God to all the nations of the earth, not just Israel, but to all the nations. And his spirit, Yahweh is going to put his spirit on the servant. This is a Trinitarian passage here. This is the father speaking to the son, saying he's going to bring and put his spirit upon him. And notice, it's my chosen one in whom my soul delights. This is the son of his love. This is the son upon whom he places his love. And those first few verses here in Isaiah 42 are a reenaction, or shall we say a prefiguring of Jesus' baptism, where the son goes into the water, the father declares, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. This is the son of my love in whom my soul delights. Coming here from Isaiah 42.1, And then the Spirit comes upon Jesus and he is commissioned as the servant of the Lord in his baptism to bring his justice to the nations. Notice, the Spirit causes Jesus not to strive. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he'll not quench. He'll not break a reed that's cracked. He'll not put out a candle that's flickering. See, he identifies with the weak and the vulnerable. He identifies with those who are in an impossible situation. He'll not extinguish them in their impossibility and their powerlessness. He will raise them up. And how will he do it? He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth And the coastlands wait for his law. The coastlands are the islands. The coastlands are the Greek world. See, the Greek world is lying in the background. Babylon captured God's people. The Lord raises up Cyrus, the king of Persia, to deliver Israel from Babylon. And then Greece is coming next. The coastlands, the islands are waiting in the distance. See, the world is changing. The way Babylon ran the world was different from the way Persia ran the world. Persia brought a different worldview, a different philosophy of life from Babylon. Greece will bring a different philosophy of life from Persia. And Rome, the fourth empire in the book of Daniel, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Rome will bring a different philosophy of the world. But in the middle of all of this, it's the servant of the Lord who will bring justice. Not Babylon. Not Persia and not Cyrus in terms of all those Cyrus prophecies about Donald Trump. 
Cyrus didn't bring the justice of the Lord. Neither did Donald Trump. Neither will any human president. Jesus, the servant of the Lord, will bring the justice to the earth. It's his gospel. It's his kingdom. It's his ways that will bring it. Not Greece and their philosophy. Not Roman, Roman power. The coastlands will wait for his law. All the nations of the earth are waiting for him. Now, let's go back. Let's fast forward and go to Matthew chapter 12 because I want you to see this first servant song, he'll bring justice. The second service song in Isaiah 49, he'll gather Israel and the nations to him. I want you to see that in the gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 12, Matthew uses the passage we've just read to describe Jesus' ministry. Go with me to Matthew chapter 12. Now in Matthew 12, we'll start in the 15th verse. My, the heading in my ESV for this section says God's chosen servant. Who's God's chosen servant? Isaiah 42, the servant of the Lord. Matthew 12, 15, Jesus aware of this, and what he's aware of is what's taking place in verse 14. The Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Jesus aware of this, withdrew from there and many followed him and he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Now Jesus' healing ministry is described in the four verses we just read from Isaiah 42. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved one with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him. He will proclaim justice to the Gentiles, justice to the nations of the earth. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. And in his name, the nations will hope, the hope of the gospel. Christ in you, the hope of glory, the hope from which faith and love proceed, Colossians 1. The hope that we have in Christ when we see him as he is and that purifies us in 1 John 3. That hope comes from Isaiah 42. Now I want you to see this. Jesus' healing ministry is not simply physical healing. That's part of it. In Acts we see that his healing ministry is tied into casting out demons. Breaking demon power is part of Jesus' healing ministry. But here, Jesus' healing ministry is that he brings justice. See, justice not only heals, I mean, Jesus' healing ministry not only heals men's bodies and heals men's souls and heals men's spirits, but it heals men's relationship with each other, human beings' relationship with each other. I use men generically. I should have said Jesus' ministry not only heals human beings physically and heals them psychologically, inner healing, and heals them spiritually by breaking demon power. It heals relationships. Oh Lord, we're praying for a healing ministry in our church, but yet we're divided from our brothers and sisters who don't have the same political views, who don't have the same skin color, who don't have the same history and experience, who don't have the same necessarily doctrines. We, we all see Jesus. We just have different ways of expressing the fullness of Christ. Oh, we want that physical healing ministry. Well, get this. Justice is the road to a full healing ministry. So Paul, Paul sees himself as the servant of the Lord. Jesus' ministry is characterized as the servant of the Lord. The servant of the Lord is the messianic one who's prophesied in Isaiah 40 through 66. We, we're understanding how the servant of the Lord is a key to leadership in the body of Christ. See, remember, all ministry, ministry, when we see the term ministry, that's the term servant. A minister is a servant, and ministry is to do service. 
all ministry, New Testament ministry, New Covenant ministry, whether it's five-fold ministry, it's leadership, or it's ministry of anybody in the church with gifts or prayer or, or, or hospitality. It's just when we say as the church, uh, each one of us has a ministry and we're called to minister the gospel and to minister to each other, all ministry goes back to the model of the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 40 through 55, particularly what we read earlier, the suffering servant. Because if the, the second servant song is about gathering Israel and gathering the nations to the Lord, and the first servant song in Isaiah 42 is about establishing justice, the third servant song, which we won't look at, it's Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 11. It's about discipleship. We'll look at it later on when we, when we examine the servant songs in, in greater depth. But Isaiah 50, 4 through 11, it's the third servant song, and it's about discipleship. The third aspect of the ministry of the Lord is to make disciples. He himself is a disciple, so out of his being discipled as the servant of the Lord, he will disciple others. See, that's the, the picture of leadership. Leaders must be disciples so that they can move in true New Testament ministry modeled on the servant of the Lord from Isaiah 40 through 55 and make disciples. And then the fourth, the fourth servant song, Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12, is the servant suffers. And it's through the suffering that he imparts everything that his people need to become servants of the Lord. So look at that. Now remember in Colossians 1, we said there's a fourfold pattern, a fourfold pattern in Colossians chapter 1 that describes how those in leadership impart what is lacking to the church of the afflictions of Christ so that each man may be presented mature, as Paul talks about in Colossians 1, 24 through 29. The first aspect is thanksgiving. We who are leaders, who will lead in ministry, whose whose Model of ministry will be the fourfold pattern of the suffering servant or the servant of the Lord. In Isaiah 40 through 55, first of all, we start by giving thanks. See, there's our discipleship. We have a thankful heart. We become thankful to the Lord. My wife uses the word all the time. She doesn't use a biblical word. The biblical word is we need to be thankful to the Lord. She's always saying we need to appreciate the Lord. Well, she's just using a modern American term. Appreciative is to be thankful. This thankful spirit is what is the beginning of all discipleship. No one or anyone who is not a disciple cannot disciple others or you're, if you're not a disciple yourself, you can't disciple others. So you must be a disciple. Thanksgiving is what makes you. Second, Paul says, I pray, I make intercession. That's the key to Isaiah 53. We'll see if we can do some, uh, some, some teaching on that this morning. If not, we'll save it for next week. Because intercession is the key to the fourth servant song that ultimately he bears the sins of many. That's a past work took place at the cross, death, resurrection of the Lord, but his present ministry that continues is he makes intercession over and over and over for the many, for the people of God, that he has come to ransom from exile and to bring into the land and give them their inheritance and, 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 and rebuild Jerusalem and establish Zion. So Paul shows the pattern of impartation, thanksgiving, we're disciples. Prayer, we're intercessors. We proclaim the gospel, we declare the gospel, we teach the gospel, we use the gospel to correct, 
We use the gospel to encourage. We use the gospel to exhort. Thanksgiving, prayer, and proclamation. Now, most churches would agree with all of those things. They'll say, well, we, 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 we're, we're, we're raising up disciples. We teach people how to intercede. And we proclaim the gospel. We teach the gospel. And then we look at the church and we say, why isn't the church becoming like Christ? Why is the church still living in Babylon? Well, that's because the fourth aspect was in Colossians 1.24. I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the church of the afflictions of Christ by my suffering. Suffering is the fourth aspect. Suffering is the fourth aspect. So for impartation to bring the church into maturity to take place, there must be thanksgiving in the life of the leaders. There must be powerful intercessory prayer and proclamation of the gospel. We, we, you, know, you proclaim and you pray, you pray and you proclaim, but then it will ultimately be suffering that releases that impartation. Now that's what we have in the fourth servant song. Now, before we go back to the fourth servant song, let's go back to Matthew chapter 8. We're in Matthew 12. Let's go back to Matthew 8. Jesus' healing ministry is, is again, is again characterized by one of the servant songs. We saw that his healing ministry in Matthew 12 was characterized by the first servant song, Isaiah 42. We've seen Paul embrace the second servant song in Isaiah 49. He embraces it as a, as a picture of his ministry. We see, we didn't look at Isaiah 50, but we reference it. That's discipleship. We'll look at that another time. But Isaiah 53 is the suffering servant. Matthew 8, 14, Jesus does a healing. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she rose and began to serve him. Isn't it interesting? He heals her and she is raised up to serve. He ministers to her out of the, out of the context of the suffering servant of the Lord and she's not just healed physically, she has a vision of service, of what it means to serve Jesus. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. Not only does Luke and Acts tie casting out demons to Jesus' healing ministry, Matthew does it here as well. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. He took upon himself our pain, and he bore, he carried our sicknesses. This is the healing ministry of the Lord from Isaiah 53. Now let's go to Isaiah 53, and we'll uh, finish up. Fourth servant song, and we looked at it this morning, but we looked at it from Jesus' ministry. Now I want to look at it from Paul's ministry, from our ministry. And while we're on our way to Isaiah 53, keep in mind, keep in mind a couple things here. Jesus not only referred to himself as the Son of Man from Daniel 7, he referred to himself as the Servant of the Lord from Isaiah 40 through 55. He said, he said, the Son of Man did not come to be served. He didn't come so everybody else could serve him. See, that's the model of the, the world's leadership is I'm in charge you serve me. And unfortunately, that model has found its way into the church. You, I'm the leader, you serve me. Former president, current president, former presidents, I'm in charge, you serve me, not Jesus. That's, that's not how it works. That is the world's view of leadership. Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus, Alexander, Augustus, all the emperors of the, of, of the four nations and all the rulers of the earth. Current, former, future. I'm the leader, you serve me. Well, that's not how it works in church. That's not how it works in the world because that's not how it works with the Lord. 
the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his soul, his life, as a ransom for many. Jesus is calling himself the servant of the Lord. And see, all ministry in the church has to be based on the Isaiah 40 through 55 model of the servant of the Lord. We bring justice. We gather God's people and the nations of the earth to the Lord. We are discipled and we produce disciples and we are willing to suffer. Now here we are in Isaiah 53. And in Isaiah 53, I want you to read these verses, but I want you to see them now. Jesus did all these things. Jesus, Jesus is suffering set us free from sin. It forgave our sin. It gave us the righteousness of the Lord. That ministry is not going to be duplicated by us. Paul is not saying when he's, he's participating in the afflictions of Christ, he's not saying that my ministry or our ministry in the body of Christ is salvific. Remember we talked about several dimensions to ministry. There's salvific and there's eschatological. Salvific means has to do with salvation. That belongs to Jesus and Jesus alone. You and I will never do that. What belongs to us is eschatological though. Salvific Jesus saves. Jesus sanctifies. Jesus imparts and imputes his righteousness to us. Jesus does those things. And remember when we, we talked about the verb tenses in Isaiah 53 earlier today, there's the final, the final saying about the servant in Isaiah 53, 12, talks about a past tense ministry and a present and future tense ministry. The future tense ministry is that the servant of the Lord makes us his servants. And as his servants, we have an eschatological purpose, not a salvific. Our eschatological purposes is that we help complete the work and the ministry of the Lord in establishing his kingdom in the earth. So Paul's apostolic imperative, what he's imparting to the church, bringing the church into maturity, it's the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. It's called maturity in Colossians 1. It's called the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ in Ephesians 4. It's the church rising into a maturity, bearing witness to Jesus in what we say, in what we think, in what we believe, and in what we do, and becoming a, a road in the wilderness for the nations to cross over to enter into the presence of the Lord. The church's eschatological purpose is to bear witness to Jesus so that the nations see Jesus. And we bear witness to Jesus not just with our words, but our life. The, wit the, 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 the servant song, the servant bears witness with his words, words of justice, words of calling Israel and the nations back to the Lord. But he also bears witness in terms of his life. He's a disciple. Isaiah 50. We'll, we'll, we'll tie that in with Colossians 1 next time. And then he suffers for the sake of the Lord, and he suffers for the many, according to Isaiah 53. Now, let's get to Isaiah 53, and we'll close, we'll close up here. I need to find my notes here. Um, Isaiah 53. I want you to look at these verses now from a standpoint of the eschatological purpose of the church. Now, this is Paul talking about Paul. This is the model of ministry that Paul has. Jesus is the servant of the Lord, the suffering servant of the Lord in Isaiah 53, and he does all of this on a salvific level for us. But we're called to enter into that eschatological level to establish God's purposes in human history. All right. Isaiah 53, let's go to Isaiah 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. We said the purposes of the Lord will prosper in the hands of the servant. Verse 14, because we want to point out the many here, the many. The many is the term that Isaiah establishes 
in contrast to the remnant. There's a remnant theology. It's Old Testament theology. The remnant theology is a few get it right with the Lord. The majority don't get it right. Christians transfer that remnant theology to the New Testament. Oh, only a few in the church are going to get it. You know, most of the church is going is, is, is to fall away. Well, that's an Old Testament perspective. The few become the many. The few, the remnant from Isaiah 6 in 1st Isaiah. 1st Isaiah, it's a remnant because Israel fails. But the few, because of the work of the servant of the Lord, become the many. And see, Paul uses that term, we the many. In Paul's writings, he calls the church not the few. He calls the church the many. God's desire is to have many sons. Hebrews says to bring many sons to glory, not few. We're not saying everybody who calls himself or herself a Christian is ultimately a Christian, but we're saying that it's the Lord's desire to bring the many to maturity, not the few. So notice verse 14 says, many were astonished at you. The many were astonished at you. That's Israel. Israel's astonished because this, this, this servant becomes the suffering servant and he's disfigured, he's despised. They're terrified. There's language used that the Hebrew here, I mean, I spent hours and hours and hours looking through the Hebrew. There's language in here that evokes images of the demonic. The suffering servant is so disfigured, he looks demonized. That's why the people are astonished. The many are astonished. Better translation, the many are terrified. But it's the many. And then verse 15 says, but this servant who's disfigured doesn't even look like a human being any longer, is what verse 14 says, is going to sprinkle many nations. He's going to purify them. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. His death, his suffering, his blood is going to purify. He's going to sprinkle the many nations. So you see the many in Israel and the many nations looking in in astonishment and terror at this servant. So that's the background. But let's take this language now and let's look at this not so much what the servant of the Lord Jesus accomplished. I did that in the Bible study. If you missed the Bible study from 1015 to 1045, go back and watch it on the podcast. It's part one. But let's look at this from the standpoint of Pauline ministry, of what real ministry needs to look like. This is how impartation works. Who has believed our declaration? Who has believed what we have proclaimed? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It's our job to reveal the arm of the Lord, the mighty, powerful arm of the Lord. This is apostolic ministry. This is what impartation is for. Verse 3 and 4. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of pain, acquainted with sickness, one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Think of that in terms of Paul. Paul was rejected by his own people, the Jews. Paul was rejected by the church, by by Jewish Christians, because he didn't stress the law enough. He stressed Jesus too much. Can you imagine? He stressed Jesus too much. He, too much. he doesn't stress the law. That's like I hear people saying, well, you're not against communism. No, I'm, I'm only for the gospel. God help me, I'm not fighting the communists in the street. Paul was rejected by his fellow Christians. He was even rejected by churches that he had started. All those who are in Asia have left me, he says in Timothy. The very churches he started in Asia left Paul. Paul's ministry, it's, it's, it's constantly going through this idea of rejection. Why? Because Paul was wrong? No, because that's how Paul suffers, just like Jesus. He enters into the afflictions of the Messiah. He suffers just as Jesus suffered, and then he imparts life to the church. The church receives life through Paul's discipleship, through Paul's intercessory prayer, 
through Paul's proclamation and teaching of the gospel and through Paul's suffering. Leaders, I said this message is for my leaders at Lord of the Harvest. Suffering, God, it's the final piece to impart maturity to the church, to impart the grace that the church needs to rise up and bear witness to Jesus in this hour. And then here's the verse that was quoted in Matthew. Surely he has carried our surely he has carried our sicknesses and borne our pain. He's carried these things. Jesus carried them for us. Now we carry them for the church. We continue, verse 7. Jesus was oppressed. He was afflicted. He opened not his mouth. We're going to be oppressed. We're going to be afflicted. Opening your mouth means, oh, I've got to justify myself. I'm going to get angry with somebody. I'm going to have a rotten Facebook posting. I'm going to fillet my spouse. I'm going to cut into pieces my brothers and sisters in Christ. Nope. You're not going to open your mouth. See, we do those things. We react out of our pain. But you can react out of your pain or submit to the Lord in the midst of your pain. When you react out of your pain, you negate the process of impartation. The only thing you impart to other people is hostility and cursing and, and deaffirmation and, and injustice. But when you submit to the Lord, when you're suffering, see Jesus held his tongue when he was in the midst of the Sanhedrin. He's giving us a picture how we prepare to impart everything that the church needs. And so the very person you want to attack by being silent and submitting to the Lord, you impart. We can attack, we can impart. He opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before it shears is silent, he opened not his mouth. He suffered and through apostolic suffering, Colossians 1.24 there's impartation. And then finally, verses 10 through 12. Yet it was the good pleasure of the Lord to crush him. See, the Lord is pleased with the servant in the first servant song, Isaiah 42, in whom my soul is pleased. He's pleased with Jesus at the baptism. He's pleased to reveal the fullness of the gospel and Christ in us, the hope and glory of the hope of glory in Colossians 1, and he's pleased also to crush his servants. Crushing means, literally one translation says, reduces us to dust. Reducing us to dust just reminds us that we're human. He's God, we're not. And as we submit to him in this process, we impart, we fill up what is lacking in the body of Christ. See, the body of Christ is unwilling to suffer. This is why we have the problem. I mean, I could do a whole teaching. Why is the, are the American church the way it is right now? It's unwilling to suffer. Why are the greatest revivals in the earth taking place in China, in Iran, and across the continent of Africa? Believers are suffering there, brethren. They're suffering. See, the American church has it so good it's like the party that the disciples had in Jerusalem and they didn't want to leave when the Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 2 when the Lord told them to go to Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. We have a party in America and we're not willing to suffer. The church is not willing to suffer and where the church is not willing to suffer, there will be no maturity. So the leaders now have to be the few who produce the many. The leaders have to be those willing to suffer. It was the good pleasure of the Lord to crush him. He has put his soul to grief. When his soul becomes a guilt offering, when the Son of Man submitted, when the servant of the Lord submitted to what the Lord was doing to him on the cross, he became able to impart life 
and righteousness and healing to God's people. We pick up our cross and follow him. We suffer. And when we pick up the cross and follow after Jesus and we suffer Christologically, we suffer righteously, we suffer like Christ for his eschatological purposes, we do the same thing. We will see our offspring. We will prolong our days. The the Lord will prolong our days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Through suffering, there's impartation. The will of the Lord prospers. Out of the anguish of his soul, well, now it's out of the anguish of Paul suffering in prison while he's writing Colossians and you and I suffering whatever sufferings the Lord deems worthy of this present time. Out of the anguish of our souls, we shall see and be satisfied. The the missing pieces of the puzzle, church, is that we are going to get all the promises of the Lord fulfilled. But those of us who are leaders not only have to be discipled and give thanksgiving and intercede and proclaim and teach the gospel, we have to be willing to suffer to release the impartation in the house. By his experiential knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, that's Jesus, shall cause many to be accounted righteous because he will bear their iniquities. He'll pay their debt. See, we suffer to pay the debt of those in the body of Christ who refuse to suffer, who refuse to obey God, who refuse to grow up. We have to do that. That's how we pay off the debt. By our suffering, we will impart grace to them. Just as Jesus suffered so we wouldn't. Leaders, you're called to suffer so the rest of the body can mature and the rest of the body can become what God desires it to become. Therefore, I will divide to him his portion, the many. See, the many become Jesus' inheritance. And the church goes from the few, the remnant leaders suffering because the rest of the body won't suffer. They go from the few to being the many. See, those for whom we're suffering become our inheritance, church. We said, oh, at the end of the the Sabbath year, we're going to get our inheritance. The end of the year of Jubilee at Lord of the Harvest that ran from, you know, uh, uh, April 2020 to April 2021. We're going to get our inheritance. Well, here's our inheritance, brethren the many become our inheritance. But when we look at the church and say, why isn't the church discipled? Suffer and that will become your inheritance. You will see many disciples produced for Jesus. You will see maturity produced for Jesus and you will see a church rise up to fulfill the kingdom purposes of the Lord in human history. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, not because he rules over them, but because he poured out his soul unto death. See, when we pour out our souls unto death, not lord it over God's flock, we serve God's flock. And really, what does it mean to serve God's flock? We suffer for God's flock. Pastor, how do I know if, as a leader if I'm, I'm serving God's people? Are you suffering for them? That's how you know. See, that's the suffering servant, the pattern of all biblical ministry. I lay down my life that you might live. Because he poured out his soul to death, he was numbered with the criminals. We can tell everybody else how they're criminals and see ourselves as righteous, or we can just say, well, I'm going to be a criminal too. Yep, so-and-so, you know, my, 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 my husband, I can't stand him. He drives me crazy. He's a criminal. I'm righteous. No, how about being a criminal with him, ministering by laying down your life? And then you can both become mature in the Lord. He was numbered with the criminals. He carried the sins of the many. See, all this is Paul talking about real apostolic ministry. And notice where it all ends. And he made intercession for the transgressors. See, that's where all all ministry ends. The suffering servant. The servant of the Lord. Four servant songs. Where does it end? What's the final thing said about the servant of the Lord? The servant of the Lord makes intercession. And it's in that intercession that we fill up what is lacking in the body of Christ. It's intercession birthed out of the ministry of Jesus and birthed out of our own suffering. We'll look more at this 
final intercessory uh, ministry of the Lord next week. Father, we come before your throne in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for part one and for part two today that you gave us a chance to share. Lord, be with everybody, Allison and, and, and her troubles, why, why she hasn't been able to lead us in worship. Lord, we, we know what those troubles are. Bring healing, Lord. Bring healing even to her beasts, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Bless Allison, raise her up. She actually is being a suffering servant, Lord. Raise her up, Father. Lord, Teresa Vandervest and her suffering, raise her up, O oh God. Anne Vassell and her suffering, raise her up, O oh God. Those of us who struggle in leadership, Lord God, those of us who struggle with personal issues, with spiritual issues, with physical issues, raise us up, O oh God, and in our suffering, may the few become the many. In Jesus' name we pray it, amen.